Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. And uh, this is another installment of our creative sustainability sessions. Um, this time, we are incredibly fortunate to have some remarkable journalists here with us. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I am coming to you from Sacramento, California, from unceded Nisenan territory. That's the indigenous community that was here long before uh, anybody who looked like me got here. Um, the indigenous communities are being uh, profoundly more impacted by COVID than any other community. It's very important uh, to know about what's going on and uh, whose land you're on. You can download the nativeland.ca app. Go to nativeland.ca, download the app. You can find out whose land you're on um, and then find out how to get involved in um, aid efforts for local indigenous communities. Um, without further ado, uh, I wanna bring on uh, Musa Okwanga, Rebecca Ruiz and Dino Ray Ramos Musa joins us from Berlin, Dino from Los Angeles, right? Yes. And Rebecca sure. from Oakland, California. Right. Um, and uh, like, so Rebecca is the one who really taught me about the ethics of like stating your conflicts of interest. Um, I just happen to be really lucky to be surrounded by amazing artists. Musa and I have been friends for 15 years, if you can believe that, it's actually, it's yeah. at least that, um, met at a conference in the high mountains of Sweden. Yeah, uh, yeah. Rebecca and I have known each other uh, 30, just about. Years. Say, say <laughs> by the bell years. Say by yes. the bell years. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and you know, you'll have to introduce um, what, what special day it is that we happen to be uh, coming together on. And Dino Ray Ramos, who like, if you, I, I said this on Twitter yesterday, but like, if you follow me, then there's a very high likelihood that you are following Dino and vice versa. Cause I feel like we're like shouting the same shit from the rooftop <laughs> platforms. Um, so welcome and thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, I wanna start like kind of at the beginning, which is like, how do you figure out that you're gonna write the truth? <laughs> how do you, how, like, how do you figure out that that's gonna be a part of your, um, your story? What is the path to get there for each of you? That's a heavy question. <laughs> Ooh, I know. <laughs> well, like, um, it, it's it's a for me it's a process. Like you know, me being a journalist for I don't know um, for over fifteen years actually started at the Oakland Tribune. Oh wow! Right. <laughs> I used to live in the Bay Area for about ten years before moving to LA. Um, and but like also I think it, this is something I struggle with today. It's kind of like the space that I'm taking, the responsibility that I have as a queer person of color at a publication where, you know, that isn't used to the kind of coverage or they just don't, it, it's always in a blind spot, right? Like, you know, different perspectives aren't necessarily traditionally in this kind of newsroom, basically. So in a space like a lot of industries that is majority cis, uh, cisgender, white and male and hetero, you know, it's kind of like, I've always struggled with, am I allowed to write about this? What will people think about me? Will I ruffle feathers? Am I allowed to ruffle feathers? That kind of thing. And writing the truth now, I think with what's been happening during this current landscape, it's, I think it's needed. And at this point, as journalists, we've always been taught not to insert ourselves into the story, right? But I kind of have thrown that out the window in this in this interesting way. And I do think that it, it is possible to be part of a community, part of marginalized voices and be unbiased and report the truth in this very even handed way without kind of, you know, leaning, you know, being, being, but being fair at the same time. And I would argue that like, for me, writing about the Asian American community or the queer community, two groups that I'm part of, um, I, I, I'm qualified to write about that because I live that experience at the same time, I think, you know, I would be hardest on them, you know, cause they're part of, you know, you're part of that group and you're gonna be hardest on your family more than anyone else, right? So um, that's how I look at it. And 
kind of, I still have that struggle. I don't know about Musa and Rebecca, but I, I still have this struggle. I think there's a certain generation that still has a struggle of like, am I allowed to be like this? And am I allowed to voice my opinion? Even though I do it every day, I still, there's that small voice in my head that says, you better think about this before you say it. With um, Whereas I think the newer generations, they kind of just are like throwing caution against the wind and being like, oh, I don't, I don't care. I'm just going to mm. say what I say. Mm. Mm. So I, there's a few things that you said that I want to try to thread together from my own perspective. So I think what you just offered is extremely valuable. Um, you know, in terms of where the instinct came from me, my dad is, has taught me growing up, like ask questions all the time. Literally we'd be somewhere and he'd be like, my daughter has a question for you. And I'd be like, I don't dad, but you know, <laughs> you know, it was sort of like this running joke. Um, but it was like a curiosity. And I learned that I, I really love talking to people. Like I love learning about different people's lives and I, and I love, and, and through that you end up somewhere around truth, right? You end up learning who people are, what, what challenges they're facing, how policy, you know, how the bigger world around them affects them and their lives and their families and their communities. And how do you, how do you put that together in a story? And I just actually really love the problem solving aspect of that. Mm -hmm. But then underneath that, there's this layer of that my dad is Mexican American. And, you know, as you can see, like I move through the world as someone who appears all white. And so I have this sort of dual experience of seeing things through the lens that of my dad's experience and, and being in, in classrooms and in, and, and in um, newsrooms that are predominantly white and, and going between worlds, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a sense of conformity that is harder on journalists of color because you are the only person in the room or one of a few people in the room and and you and you want to do the job right and you want to be accepted and yet you also know the conversations that are happening around the table are marginalized people marginalized experiences um and often aren't objective right there's this assumption like we default to whiteness as objectivity and I think that has been a real challenge. And, you know, from my own experience, like it's, I came through a very traditional training in journalism. I went to a graduate school at UC Berkeley, a program that I love and um, is terrific. And I went to, I worked at Forbes, I worked at NBC News Digital and had like a very traditional background. And it wasn't until the past five or six years that I started to like tiptoe into inserting myself into the story um, because of that fear around like, should I say this? Is this okay? Is it allowed? Is it going to cost me a job in the future if someone thinks that I'm biased? When in fact, what I'm doing is reporting, right? Fact finding, contextualizing, and all of those things go to the point of fairness, which is what we're supposed to do and speak truth to power. I'll stop there. That's just my <laughs> You said it better than me. <laughs> right? I think we're saying complimentary. <laughs> well, no, so just to add to that, that that's amazing. Um, so I'm my background. Uh, I identify as a queer person of color. Um, I suppose pronouns he, him, and my background. Like I was brought up not really to question anything, actually, um, because the consequences of doing so were severe. So my family from Uganda, refugees from two successive wars. I suppose genocides already, and so there was really not much incentive to speak out. But I think there was always this insistence, and. I guess my career, I, I'm primarily as well, I will say out of respect to both what you do. I'm someone who reports now and then, but primarily I operate as an opinion writer, but I do get reporting work now and again. And the discipline I try to bring to both is, it's a corrective. Like if we don't report what we see as objective fact, then we'll get steamrolled. So for example, my family from the north of Uganda, um, there was a big story a few years ago, Invisible Children uh, put out this, this NGO put out a huge ad campaign about finding yep. this warlord. And I saw this and I was like, my family's from that village. Like we're from there. Like, and the way it's being reported in this video is completely wrong. So the first thing I did was an opinion piece. My first piece of major writing was a corrective to this narrative going, well, that warlord basically came out of this village because he was fighting against this genocidal leader. And that's where it began. And then subsequently my approach as a journalist Whenever I report, so I've reported on FGM, I've reported on so female genital mutilation, I've reported on racism in football, and I've reported on the far right in Germany. In each case, it's been, I've seen my role as curating fact 
that wasn't in the mainstream before. And I think the benefit of being a queer person of color is we're kind of the early warning systems of history. <laughs> we're, you know, we're at the coal face. If I'm gonna be, let me be real. Like I live half an, I live less than half an hour's walk from someone who organizes major far right activity in this area. Like I know that because the anti-fascist networks know that. And I know that because it's important to have that information because it's personally important, not just professionally. Mm. Now that gives me, that sounds perilous and it's not ideal, but at the same time, I get like the first drop on a conversation like that. So I feel my role as someone who is exposed to this stuff primarily is to give people an early warning. So that's that's my, my motto. Uh, sorry, I, I'm gonna need to spend a long time with the perfection of that turn of phrase <laughs> uh, because there's something about that that's so arresting to think about how the default in the US and I would argue probably in Europe also has been to whiteness, the perspective of whiteness as the objective perspective. And you're flipping that on its head, the three of you, and saying, no, in fact, we have greater access to the actual facts yeah. than, than others probably even before anybody else would be alerted to them. And so I'm really curious, we're going like way, way down the pipeline. And so we'll just go, I, I, these are truth tellers, like let's get to the point. Um, I talked to you guys a little bit. I sent you an email about that Sam Sanders NPR piece where he was talking about why there's been a reckoning in uh, in newsrooms across the country uh, relating to the the suppression, the marginalization of, of especially reporters of color who have been the early warning signs for quite some time. And he said specifically that he thought that the problem started when Donald Trump started using this insane racist rhetoric and journalists everywhere were being told not to use the word racist and not mm. to say the word lie. And so now we were they were starting to be asked overtly to be doing something that they were covertly being asked to do before, which was conform to the whiteness normalization. And so I'd just be curious to hear you kind of talk about the way, you're talking a little bit about how your personal relationship to reporting has evolved, but like, what has this time done to the way that you're reporting? Has it changed the conversations you can have with your editors? Does it does it change the stories that you're trying to tell? Um, I think I think so. Um, when when you were saying about that that stuff about Trump and and and, and not using the word racism and and lie and all of that. The, the story that immediately came to my head is Maria Ressa in the Philippines and Duterte and all of that, that and how as, as a journalist, even as a Filipino, I'm just, I look at what's happening in the Philippines and I'm like, oh, Maria Ressa said this. She's like, oh, they're testing this here. You know, they shut down ABS-CBN and they shut down, uh, uh, they put her in jail you know, or I think she she got indicted or um, found guilty of uh, what is it a uh, 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 libel or slander, and she's like, oh, they test it here so they could bring it out to the rest of the world. Yeah. And when she said that, I was all, I kind of got scared. You know, I'm like, oh, that's true. And that relationship, you know, personally, my my parents, I, I don't I don't mean to put them on blast, but they are conservative. And when I talk to them about Duterte, um, they're like, oh, well, at least he's cleaning up the streets. And I'm all, what? Yes, law and order. Like, yeah, and I'm like, and of course it's a different generation, blah, blah, blah. And I told my mom, I was all, let me ask you this. I was like, oh, if Trump did that to me, because I'm a journalist, what would you say? And then she just remained silent. She was just like, oh, oh. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> Uh, because having that conversation is difficult. But as far as what you were talking about, like what I could write about, I feel like this time has kind of freed us up in my experience at Deadline. And like, I think this reckoning is both good and bad in that it's opening people's minds, but it's also bad because I'm like, oh, well, it took you long enough, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and I'm just... I think my editors are a little bit more open and, you know, a, a little bit more willing to hear the things that I, I have to say. But at the same time, it has inspired me to not ask anymore, to not ask for permission, 
Um, and I just roll with it until until people say, hey, Dino, can you reel it in a little bit? <laughs> but but, but I, I still, rem I mean, I still work for a publication and I still yeah. have to respect their brand. I still have to respect the boundaries and parameters of journalism. But at the same time, like Rebecca was saying, it's like oh, when we write, we our perspective contextualizes things. And it doesn't necessarily mean that like, you know, we're, we're reporting facts based on our lens. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we're not reporting opinion as fact. That's right. kind of the, the, the basic thing there. I'm not afraid of the word racist. I just don't necessarily know if it's that valuable to use in reports, I mean, and that's not because it's not, it's an important, you know, to talk about this, but my journalistic history, hero is Ida B. Wells, and Ida B. Wells just told stories, and their stories were so vivid, and actually, the thing about the word racist is it's kind of lost its power. Mm -hmm. um, not that we shouldn't use it, don't get me wrong, but we shouldn't expect it to be um, a sort of a nuclear weapon. Jay-Z Jay referred to Trump as a superbug, how America actually had given him so much exposure that he's now immune to all these accusations that we throw at him. And I actually don't think it started with Trump. I think it started with this idea of, of balanced opinions, that there's always two sides to a story. Mm. There aren't two sides to a lynching. You know, look, mm. we're in a situation now where we are, we're in existential danger as a species because we debated that icebergs weren't melting, even though 99% of scientists were like, that iceberg is melting. And now we're going to be dig we're going to be debating its rising sea levels for the rest of our the rest of our adult lives. Um, so, like, I think it I think it started. No disrespect, but I think uh, to that to that author. I just think it started a long time before Trump. And I think almost those are kind of subconscious attempts to absolve ourselves of the society we've been creating for decades, not just in the U.S. but in the U.K. as well, in Australia. And the one thing I will say, last of all, is it's so ironic that in a time of closing borders and nationalism. The one thing that's being truly, truly globalized is authoritarian techniques. Authoritarian mm. techniques, you know, these regimes, Uzbekistan, China, um, you know, anywhere like Iran, Syria, they're all learning from each other. They're all hanging out. They're, their kids will go to similar schools, hang out at similar private members clubs. Um, so, yeah, that's all I've got to say about that. I mean, I think that is that is one of the key problems in journalism now, right? That there, and for such a long time, there's just been this obsession with the two sides to every story. And I, I reflect on this a lot, and I think the lynching example is a tragic but effective one because it's mm. absolutely right. Um, but I reflect on this a lot in, in thinking about, okay, how am I telling the story? You know, what perspective am I maybe um, willing, like, willingly downplaying because maybe it it goes against some of the beliefs that I personally hold. Like, I'm just gonna be frank. Like I have those thought processes trying to check myself because I think that is important. You know, I'm not, I think that critical thinking is what journalism is, good journalism is, right? And so you have to look inward. Um, but, you know, I also, as a lot of this is just about being on the right side of history, I think. You know, we can't be debating things at, that are obvious and true and factual and trying to say, well, this person is actually, you know, actually didn't, you know, make this policy. And it, it just, it, it, right now what I think is happening is we're being asked to not believe what our eyes see. And, mm. you know, and I think that is the problem and journalism in some ways is not helping. Now, having said that, I will, I will add that my editors are extremely supportive. And since I got to Mashable, I sort of was like six years ago, you know, my first, the first editor in chief that we had during my time there, um, when the um, uh, same sex marriage decision came down from the Supreme Court, we, we embraced it. We knew, I think we changed our avatar to the rainbow flag um, and, I, I, all of us were sort of like, those of us from a traditional, more traditional background were sort of like, oh, this is interesting. Like we can do this. It's on the right side of history, right? But um, that was that was kind of a new thing, right? You wouldn't see a lot mm. of other news organizations doing that. Um, so I, I think there, there's there been some good progress in that direction for news organizations that are like digital native. Um, and then you still see the legacy, you know, organizations clinging to, let's not call that a lie. Let's not call that racist. And and I think, you know, to your point, that word may have lost its power, but also there is, it is important to be able to say 
with language what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. My my own personal reflection on this is I'm not. I don't know if it's valuable at all. But I I studied anthropology in college, and I remember having and I was like, I, this is what I'm going to do. Like I'm obsessed with people and why they operate and and why we organize the way we do as societies. I think there's so much we learned there. And then I remember um, Musa reading an anthropologist on who was reporting on female genital mutilation from the objective academic perspective of like it's who am I to judge the practice uh it makes them feel the way that they want to feel and so if I'm going to take a relativist approach which is what they say in anthropology and judge them from their own internal value system who am I to judge and I was like oh, okay all right <laughs> okay um I don't think I can do this anymore <laughs> and I, I actually remember going in to defend my thesis which was about people who did voluntarily uh modify their body. I ended up writing about body modification in the US and, and these rising internet communities called social networks. Um, no. uh, in oh, 2000, 2001, I guess I started writing that. Um, but I remember saying to my professors, like, I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to continue my, my work here because this notion of relativism, it, it stinks to me. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I didn't know why then, honestly. I was just like, at the time I was like, it's not activist enough. Mm -hmm. and, and But that was like half the story. And I feel like what you're fleshing out now is actually that like, it's just not the truth. Yeah. Right? Like the, the in Oh. You frozen? Frozen? Or are you no. acting? <laughs> just, no, um, the entire concept of relative <laughs> Western, right? <laughs> Can you guys hear uh, me? Yeah, absolutely. Can, can I just jump in there and yeah. be like, um, Bishops, I mean, it was it Fox News have the whole fair and balanced thing. That's their thing, that's their slogan. They were hiding in plain sight. Like mm. any slogan that a far right TV network tries to impose on you is clearly like just morally bankrupt. And <laughs> it's funny because that whole assessment of FGM and like their values, I always think to myself, yeah, but if you look for the feminists in that community, they have a different story for you. Yeah. And that's what we did. We went and spoke to the feminists. When people talk about society and that's just their culture, I always think, find the left wing, find the progressive people in that group, and they'll tell you what's going on. And they'll be in the villages. There was a woman, when we, we were in Sweden, Emily, there was a woman talking about climate change, and everyone was like, oh, Africans don't get climate change. And then she turned up, and she was there from, I think she was there from Nigeria, and she said to her mother, like, ah, oh, my mother was like, where are you going? Where are you going to Europe? What are you doing in Europe? Mum, I'm going to talk about climate change. We're going to talk about climate change in Europe. And then mum was like, climate change? We've had that here for 30 years. Look at the well. 30 years ago, the well was here. Now it's here. We've had it for 30 mm. years. And that was an old Nigerian woman who apparently does not understand climate change, right? Who doesn't have the sophistication. Who was like, you, why are you flying to Europe? <laughs> <laughs> Systems of knowledge and forms of learning, like Native American... You know, like they've all been scorned, they've been laughed at. All these yeah. forms, these or isn't it so interesting how rational, logical facts? Well, look, a border, a colonial border, is a rational, logical fact, but it's drenched in blood, right? Mm. Oral history is frowned upon. People are told, "Don't insert yourself into the story." And some of the greatest historians of all time are oral historians. So my mum was telling me a story. She's going. Oh, there's there's a woman. That, this happened to this, and during the war, this person got dragged out of their operating table, and they got like there was our greatest surgeon of all time got dragged out of operating theatre, was never seen again. My mum was reading off all these facts, and with my Western cynical mind, I was like, let me go and Google all of this in perfect detail. My mum remembered this perfect detail, and here I am with my Western logical rational mind going, let me just fact check that. This thing was pitch perfect. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So we've had this like, we've had this rational, logical thing imposed on us, but a lot of it is is the framework is is bankrupt. A lot of it. So how does this then interact with? I mean, Musa, you write for the Guardian and the Ringer, Rebecca for Mashable, Dino for Deadline. Like, like these are big businesses, right? How does this start to interact? This because you have this clear pro profound sense of the power of the the perspective the, the, the let's call it the outsider perspective which in the sort of um 
the journalistic canon would be the imbalanced perspective, I suppose. Um, so, so how do you now bring that to work? Like, how does that show up to work? Because I think that's a piece that that everybody's still trying to figure out. Like, how do we get equity to interact with capitalism? <laughs> and I'm very curious. Like, how does, how does that? Sorry, did I did I did I say that out loud? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, let, let me try that again. <laughs> How does that show up at work for you? Oh, I've already talked a lot, so I'll let you answer, but I've got an answer anyway, but carry on. No, yeah, I've got an answer. Go, go ahead, Musa. Okay, if I could tell you, <laughs> if I could tell you how much money I have turned down to be sitting here, if I could tell mm. you how much money, how much, okay, I got offered, I've been offered tens of thousands by rum companies, by, um, goodness, like football organizations to write this, to like, to, mm. to sport wash that, to sanitize this. Oh, we've got a big tournament coming up. Can you write this documentary about it? Oh, I know that we're bombing hospitals over there, but can you write this to do this? The amount of money I've been, mm. I'm a writer. This isn't my flat. I don't own, I don't own a property. I might never own one. The only way that equity, we can find that within capitalism is to basically, and this is what I've managed to do. I've basically built, I'm um, 40 years old now. It's taken me, I mean, you've known me for that for so long, Emily. It has taken me 17 years. It's cost me so many, I would say, relationships, both actual and personal ones, just so many things it's cost me because I've, I've so often said no to money that made the world worse. And I'm now at a point where capitalism has recognized that my integrity has a brand value and it has invested in me so I can say what the hell I like because I've been paid for that and I've negotiated that. And if, I, if they say, oh, you can't say that, I'm like, you know what, I've been broke before I'm out. Hmm. I've been broke the biggest, the last 18 months, I was offered more money than I've ever been offered for anything. And I turned it all down. And that's why I'm now working with the ringer because I said no to everything else. And I'm not judging people that take the money. This isn't me going like I'm moral and righteous. I'm just saying that my own life, my personal professional existence is the bitter, brutal, is the bitter and brutal cost of trying to do the right thing. And my mm -hmm. job now as a senior writer is to make it so much easier so the kids coming through, the people coming through, mm. don't have to make those sacrifices. You know, it's possible. You should be able to have a mortgage and report responsibly, which you can. Mm. And by the time we're all done, all three of us journalists on this call, by the time we're all done, this is going to be so natural to do what we're doing. There won't be these sacrifices. So that's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So, yeah. Here yeah, is the lesson. Think <laughs> I, I think ultimately it's, it's kind of like that sellout conversation right you know um i don't know it's like i'm i'm mo I, I think most of you all know i'm i mostly write in entertainment film and tv and yeah and that ecosystem boy do you have time to talk about <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> it's i i get you know it, it a lot of it isn't even money. A lot of it is social commodity or like, mm. you know, just kind of getting your name out there, making sure that people know who you are. Um, I mean, I think I will just say this. It's, it's kind of difficult with, you know, when you are part of a, a, a trade publication that's, mm. you know, battling with two other ones, you know, and even within our own uh, publication, I think at any job, you are kind of even competing with your, uh, your co-workers. Mm -hmm. Co-workers who are quote unquote senior and, you know, just trying to, I've, oh, I've always just had, I, I've never really, I don't get offered that much money. <laughs> well, from people like, kind of like, like all, you know, what Musa was saying, people are, cause I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm staff and, you know, there is a, you know, we're not allowed to do kind of in kind stuff and, and, and all that. Um, but I think it's mostly about favors in, in yeah. especially in entertainment. And yeah. you're like, all oh, if you, it's kind of, I feel, and it's a lot of it's unsaid. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, if you do X, we'll give you Y and then maybe Z down the line. Yeah. So I have to, like, let's say I want to interview a big celebrity or like I want to do a, a feature story on someone who's huge. I'm not going to name any names just because, you know, the definition of big celebrity is so fluid. Like TikTok stars. I don't know. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you you work with the publicist and they're like, oh, oh they're not available. 
But then you see your colleague get the interview and you're all, what's going on there? But they will give you another one of their clients. It's it's this whole yeah. weird thing that I'm just like, I'm tired. Can I just do my job? You know? And you know, I I I will say this flat out. I'm I'm kind of just kind of throwing caution against the wind here. It's like I, of course, have a lot of friends in the business, in film and TV, who are actors, filmmakers. Some of them are kind of mid-career. You may know their name. Some of them are a little bit more reputable. They will call me or text me and say, hey, you know, I am trying to come to you with this breaking news. Will you write about it? And I'm all, yeah, sure. Just let me know. Let your, you know, get your publicist, the network, whoever, have them send me the information and then I'll do it. And then they're like, okay, I'll tell them. A week later, I could see one of my other colleagues or another person from a publication has posted that exclusive. And I'm just like, what happened there? And I'm not blaming my friend because they're just like, they want me to break their news, but the network, their publicist, the manager, their agent, whatever, has different plans for them that doesn't involve me. So that is where kind of my, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, capitalism, but it's a different kind of. It's so, well, it is, it is all part of it, right? Like, it's, yeah. you know, just because my perspective also being in the entertainment business is like, if I'm looking for somebody to break the stories about like representation in the business, I, I, I go to your feed, you know? Mm, like, you. And, and <laughs> I, I, I feel like, I feel like it's interesting because you told me this on a call one time. How many people of color are staff at all three trade all three major trades? Um, we, uh, at Deadline, it's me and Amanda who host the New Hollywood podcast. Plug, um, and then <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then we recently hired another Filipina, Alex Al Alexandria de uh, de la Rosio, Rosario. Oh my God, I may be butchering her name. And then at I'm, I'm not too sure about THR and Variety, but ever since this reckoning, we see a lot of publications kind of scrambling and dare I say shitting their pants <laughs> when it comes to like hiring people of color, queer people, women, or or whatever. Um, and I, but it, but now it, it, I'm happy that representation in newsrooms is going up. Yeah. But it took a pandemic, the death of George Floyd, to do it. Yeah. You know, not the, not even just George Floyd, but just. Yeah. You know, the black community. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, it, it makes me happy and it makes me sad. Um. But yeah. you know, we strive ahead. New yeah. Hollywood podcast hosted by me and Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, if I can add something here that you and I have talked about this notion of scarcity in in our sort of capitalist culture, and um, I think that is what plagues journalism. I mean, it plagues every industry, right? But I think to what Dino was saying, the 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 competition, right? Like it is a it is an industry that really pits people against each other um, for fame, fortune, and it can be. Let's put it that way. In terms mm. of which newsroom you're in, um, and and what job you want to get, um, and I think that what's happened in addition to that is that there's been this incredible emphasis on branding, um, too, for individual journalists. Um, to market yourself. Um, and I think like these combination, and that's not a bad thing, right? In a, in a sense, you know, you can reach people directly, you can reach readers directly, you can get ideas and sources. Um, and there's a lot of really good things about that, but there's also, it creates another kind of competition for attention. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also think I'm just a little attuned to the scarcity issue because I'm being based in the Bay Area, the, the, um, the business is not that strong here in terms of what opportunities are available. So it's sort of like, you know, sometimes you can feel like you're on a lifeboat, right? Um, and you know, whereas if you're in other places or you're a freelancer, you know, um, working for major outlets, like it, you, you might have a little bit more sense of, okay, there's, I, I can see a path going forward. Um, anyway, you know, I think like to the issue of equity, like all of those factors have created like barriers to to making equity systemic in newsrooms. 
Mm. Um, and I, and I don't, I don't know how you solve it. You know, I am extremely likely to work for the people I work for. And, um, you know, I don't worry necessarily about my page views, you know, sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not great. But mm. my, my goal is to be writing stuff that you can't read anywhere else, even if it gets fewer page views than I would like. And that's mm. just one, one measure of what success could look like. And I think that commodification too is problematic because, you know, yeah. You know, actually one, I, I thought about one possible structure that might provide some solution. The reason I'm not optimistic is because it relies on wealthy people providing endowed um, foundations, which then you can use, you can draw down um, salaries. So basically treat journalism as a, as a non-profit enterprise, which I feel it is. It's a public, it's a public health investment to have successful journalism. But my fear, if you look at like, you know, you look at the kind of Iron Man movies and like the Avengers movies, we've got a benevolent billionaire who forks out lots of money to protect the world. But in real life, you know, our, our billionaires are like pumping weights and like blasting off into space. So, mm. like my, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, that, that's, I mean, you know, the Avengers, I love those movies, they're basically marketing for Elon Musk, aren't they? Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so, my frustration really is that the solutions are there. They've always been there. The solutions for climate have always been there. The techniques have always been there. But it's that old question, the political will. Um, mm. I don't know. I just feel like I don't want to put too much pressure on young people. But I feel that my role, as far as I can, is to platform their views as much as I can and listen to their perspectives because what they don't have right now is the platform to say the things that they want to say. Mm -hmm. So until they get to my position, I'll basically just amplify everything I can mm. and chip away. Because look, look how much the protests achieved in just a few weeks. Yeah, mm. really. I mean, really, really. Huge. Um, so, Musa, there's a, a longtime Stadio, Stadio podcast listener, Laurie Laker, who asked a question. Oh, Laurie, um, shout out Laurie, how's it going? <laughs> uh, which is uh, about the overlay of your journalistic lens and your personal integrities and how that applies to your sports writing, right? Because a lot of what you do is write opinion, you've written books about sports. Um, and I think their question is really interesting, which is like, does it, does that, does that give you a wider playing field or a narrower one, do you feel like? Well, I think, look, I can speak for Dino and Rebecca maybe as well, that we're committed to telling what we see as the truth or objective fact as much as we can. The very mm -hmm. beginning of my career, what was that? that it was it's a 50 Cent. 50 Cent said, if you start somewhere, if you start as a particular artist, they've got, they'll keep buying you that way. You can't suddenly start doing folk music three albums in. If you start with like rap about the street, you've got to stay on that. So when I started my career, I basically made it as broad as possible. I spoke as frankly as I could on as many platforms as possible. And I gambled, but I was talented enough to still have a career despite burning bridges by upsetting people by saying what I felt I had to say. Mm. That was my gamble. I was like, okay, look, you identify as bisexual, you're black, you're dark skinned black man. These are all things that are important. People see you and find you intimidating just by the way you talk at them just because you're telling them something they didn't want to hear. So that's, those, are, those can be disadvantages. So I basically gambled that despite those pinch advantages, I was a good enough writer to still make a career. So I basically burnt all my bridges back in 2000. And, and well, I was burning before I met you actually, Emily. I burned them back in 2003, four. And the last 16 years has just been trying to like live off the, the capital that was left, I guess. Mm. And is that because it was primarily in sport where the capital was left or was it because that's like, that's a place that you feel really, it feels important to you to bring your perspective? It was because look, sport is a really great way. It's, it's basically anthrop it's free anthropology for us. It's a way to examine and begin conversations. You can have conversations about dictatorships in the Philippines through football, but you can't necessarily have through religion because it's about religion. Everyone shuts down. But it's about a big football match in the Philippines. It's easier than you can talk about match fixing, right? So football for me was a tech was a it was a way a prism to examine society. At mm. the same time, as a person of color, we can all relate. All of us in this call it's easy to get pigeonholed. And I thought to myself, if I am multiple things, if I'm constantly putting out political journalism, football punditry, spoken word, electronic music, I've done all of those things, I feel like to a level as well as I can, then no one knows what's coming next. So after a certain point, after 15 years of me just dumping so much, for example, next year I've got like multiple books coming out about completely different topics, love, dating, sexuality, race, um, children's books, adult books, 
if I dump so much on the market, they're going to be like, we can't, we, we can't pigeonhole this guy. Just let's just shut up and let's listen. To, let's hope he goes away. But mm. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> it's so <laughs> it's so interesting that like the tactics, right? The approaches that you're taking, and I feel like what we have here also is that perfect sort of inside the system, outside the system approaches that like. The, like you you have to and so Dino you used the word earlier sellout which I actually have a really hard time with because I think uh in that sellout conversation we undermine the people who are using the tools of the system to dismantle mm -hmm. it right and so you take you have this like inside outside perspective and I both we have to have both right yeah. we have to have the outside pressures right the opinion writers, the like, the people who are not going to let you get away with the thing. And then internally, you have to have the people who are like putting pressure on the system as well. Um, one of the things we had this amazing question from Jennifer Clore about um, media literacy, because when you talk about like one of the barriers, like what do you what are you thinking today about the the state of media literacy? How much do you feel like how much can you take responsibility for and how much is how much is now becoming an obstacle take responsibility for as a writer you mean or a reporter yeah i mean i think one like weird um thing that matters is is how pieces are labeled and i know that's kind of like a boring thing but a lot of um including uh smashable we stopped labeling things opinion um and I, I think that can be a real challenge for readers who are reading something and think that they're reading just a regular news story and then don't realize it's an opinion or it's an analysis, it's a perspective, mm -hmm. and then feel resentment or frustration that, oh, it's just biased, you know, oh, you know. Um, and so I think that I don't, it's tough because I think that, and also in our attention economy, people don't necessarily pay attention to the labels anymore. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is, except for more media literacy in schools around like, if you're reading, these are the different types of stories you could be reading or coverage you could be reading. And this is how you might make distinctions between them. And this is what you might expect from them. And mm -hmm. also understanding that so much stuff is coming at people from um, platforms that they don't know, or um, it's a tough thing because you don't want to say only legacy, you know, institutions matter and should have visibility because that's not right. But you also don't want people pulling videos from YouTube channels of far right people and saying like, "Well, this is this is journalism," when it, you hmm. know, it's not. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's another challenge. Well, can you? Do, I, I just want to push more on that because like. We've talked a lot already, and you just said this is journalism, but people are saying this is journalism when it's not. What is journalism anymore? Like, if you're really going to put a on it now, like, what? Let's talk about that label. So, I'll give an example the Very Toss Project, um, which is, I now I feel bad. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. David, David Dadelin, I think, is how you say it, but he was the one who went undercover. Um, for Planned Parenthood, and they've been recently trying to get um, hospital workers to, trying to go undercover in hospitals to prove that COVID is a hoax. So, and I mean, like, I know, right? But but it also is like really worrisome to me because people are looking to that as this is real journalism. Mm. And I, my argument would be that it's not. You know, and maybe that's a tricky argument because maybe he is doing valuable investigative reporting, but he's operating from a premise of this thing is a hoax. Bias. Right. Confirmation bias in a way that's actually like, yeah. it's like seeing the iceberg melting and saying it's not melting. Yes. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Huh. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's asking a bad faith question. I think so. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's journalism. Um, as we might define it, but your question's a good one. You always do this, Emily. You come up with questions I don't know how to answer. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's uh, journalism is like fluid now, right? Like, right. what the hell is this? Like, I mean, I was like asking myself this. I was like, oh, is there even is there even journalism school anymore? Do people learn the inverted pyramid, <laughs> or or like what is going on? Because you know, uh, I, I went to you know Texas A and M and went to journalism school there. 
learn AP style and all like very, very traditional. We had to take the grammar, spelling, punctuation test in order to take classes. And then now I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm I, is that out the window now? Or do, do we not have to adhere to that anymore? It's, I don't know what journalism, and we have people, like I said, like on TikTok reporting, or, you know, we have, you know, I mean, I, uh, I, I do get some of my information from like Instagram stories, sure. but at the same time, they come from reputable sources. Right. And I think re reputable sources are, that's where the problems come in. <laughs> it's like, what's reputable? What, what's yeah. not? It's like, you know, I, I'll go, I'll still go. I mean, even though they are, you know, more progressive publications, go to like New York Times or, or Washington, Washington Post. And at Deadline, what I like about at Deadline is that we won't jump on a story unless it's confirmed. Like we have to confirm everything. Like I think one time when Tom Petty died, um, everyone was saying, oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. But in actuality, he wasn't yet. I mean, that sounded rude. I'm sorry. But like he was still he hadn't officially passed and we didn't report it because we didn't get official confirmation. But everyone else was. And I think I I myself still adhere to old school journalism in that way. But at the same time, I'm I'm embracing uh, ways to report facts, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. like like TikTok, like yeah. Instagram. Yeah. And um, how to deliver the message is changing, but the message is the same, I guess is right. what I'm trying to get up. Yeah. I, I don't think, I actually, journalism, I think it's clearer than ever what journalism is, funny enough. I think that the mediums have always changed, but, you know, the method of delivery, but the, the ethos, the, you know, at the end of the day, we know journalism is multiple reported sources to verify, you know, you look at Ida B. Wells, the history of lynching in the South. That to me is the quintessential act of journalism multiple sources, backed up, witness testimony, cross-examined, and that way, because then, if, you, if you're examining something as a hoax, very quickly that premise falls apart. Mm. Bad faith analysis falls apart very quickly. It mm. falls apart within like half a day, to be honest, mm. like a bit of two or three phone calls, the thing implodes, right? Mm. And some can say that's journalism, it's not, it's viral marketing for, mm. for idiots. It's mm. viral marketing for, for, for bad faith. And the reason why, unfortunately and tragically, we know more than ever what journalism is, is because more than ever journalists are being murdered. That poor mm. man in Slovakia who was murdered for investigating corruption, the poor woman in Malta, um, Daphne garana Belica, you know, being murdered for investigating financial malpractice. Um, the conservation journalists being murdered in South America, like all the ones looking at the drug trade, like people know what journalism is. And the scary thing is at a time when journalists doing the frontline work, which I'm not doing more than ever, they're under-resourced doing it. This is what's so devastating at a time when they need us most. You know, I look at like Anna Politkovskaya in Russia, who was basically taking on horrifying amounts of corruption by herself and ends up dead in a ditch. I mean, where's mm. the incentive? To, it's, it's almost like we know, we know more than ever what journalism is as a society, but we're more afraid than ever to do what it takes to be journalists, if that makes sense. That's so true. And it's like, I think it, it goes to that saying, it's like, if you're getting trolled, you're doing something right. That kind of thing. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. We're, we're doing a good job on this conversation because we are being trolled uh, in this particular <laughs> conversation. Also. I saw. I was like, I was like, how, how common uh, and also how boring. Um, uh, this is really fascinating and also devastating what you say, because uh, as we are, I kind of want to shift to a question that I think is related, which is there's media and then there's social media. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's, I'm curious because all three of you are active on social media in different ways. And what is the gap there? Because Acts of journalism are are actual, they're real radical acts, like speaking truth to power, Rebecca, as you said. Um, Musa, the, 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 the risk to your life that so many people are taking to do that. Um, and yet there's an expectation, really an expectation that these storytellers are also going to show up as themselves, as a brand on the internet to interact with 
bad faith actors and trolls and like all of those things. So I'm curious, how do you how do you balance the 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 integrity of the work that you're trying to put out in the world and then the demand, the assault that is, you know, having to show up also to be the brand? I don't show up. That's what that's my <laughs> answer. <laughs> like <laughs> that's why actually to be honest with you, like I I do I do, I do post on Twitter, but um, only when I feel like it, like when I feel compelled. And that probably has cost me in some ways. Like I could probably have a much larger following and you know, um, opportunities missed. But on the other hand, I truly don't know how people who have larger followings, including some of you folks, like deal with the, that onslaught that you're talking about. Because I observe on Twitter, like a lot of the ideas I get come from listening to different people's perspectives, experiences, and I'm not just talking about blue checkmark people. I'm talking about like things that are surfacing, um, points of view, perspectives, like that's all really valuable to me. And so is interacting with people who read my work. But the other part of it, that's why I kind of, I kind of like checked out a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, it is, it is weird. It's like it, trying to step away from social media because it's so ingrained in media, because it's social media. And I'm lucky to where I try to stay positive. And I am kind of trash on Twitter too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good it's a good place for me to joke and to like spread the news, spread the word, and even just kind of build a sense of community. But I, I want to say this knock on wood, I, I barely get trolls, but when I do. It, it it kind of I, I I think I have this joy in muting. I think muting is better than blocking because they don't know that you mute them. <laughs> so I I kind of use Twitter to mostly uplift and to find community and to connect with like what Rebecca's saying is like kind of being of this weird observer and um I, I've met some great people on, uh, via Twitter and we have Twitter friends, you know, and I, I did like, and it could be used for good because I want, I was just curious one day. I was just like, huh, I wonder how many Filipino and Filipino Americans are out in Hollywood doing work besides just actors and directors who are below the line, who, who are, you know, you know, cinematographers, you know, storyboarders. And I just tweeted, I said, Hey, who's Filipino out there and is in Hollywood? The response was amazing, you know? And I, cause like, I, I personally think that uh, the, the, the Filipino community, you know, we barely see their stories and, you know, and if they are, they're kind of very niche and they don't go beyond an Asian film festival. And I, I was really grateful for that, but yeah, social media is trash and I will remain on it. <laughs> <laughs> That is, those are words for a gravestone. <laughs> those are words, that is an yeah. obituary. <laughs> wow, okay, that social media for me has changed my life. It's been incredible, it's changed my career. And look, I love it. I, I follow maybe, I think, two and a half thousand people on Twitter, which is incredible because I follow from like the whole range. I mean, I don't follow, I even follow some like far right accounts just because it's good to know what these people are complaining about. It's always something new. Um, but yeah, I, my knowledge, it's unbelievable. You don't realize until you step away from Twitter to have a conversation with someone, just how much, because I, you know, I follow all these random, like sort of Lebanese um, work, migrant workers uh, from, you know, what's happening in Syria, Srebrenica, like the Balkan remembrance politics. You're like, whoa, there's so many things that I'm tuning into. So as a learning thing, like my curated Twitter feed is an absolute joy. I'm just absorbing information the whole time. Mm. In terms of getting trolled, I mean, I mean, once you get your first death threat and laugh it off, then you, you don't laugh at it at first, but after your first death threat, you get it and then you kind of absorb it. You're like, okay, I'm still alive and you carry on. Um, and, you know, I had a pretty brutal experience my first of 2012, 2013. I've been on Twitter for like 10 years now, but about two, three years it was really rough and I was blocking and muting quite a lot, getting a lot of abuse, orchestrated abuse. But after a while, it's like, I won't look for it, but if it comes, it comes. Mm. And, and the way I engage with bad faith very specifically, I was reading recently, rereading um, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, and the yeah. opening paragraph, he says, very rarely do I explain my methods. If I did, I'd be answering messages all day. 
and I only mm -hmm. respond to those. I'm responding to you in, in particular in that letter, he said, because you've approached me in good faith and you want to learn. Mm. And you can tell who the bad faith actors are by this point. Right. And they're not engaging, they're just engaging with you to upset you. And the second you clock that, you're like, oh, I'll make an example of you. My favorite technique now, technique now is to wait a few hours after their insult has come in and then refer to the insult without quoting them or mentioning the text. So they can see I've mentioned them. They can see that I'm making a point to them and saying, these are the kinds of critiques that I get. Here's what I respond to them. And that way mm. you educate people more widely and that person doesn't get their place in the sun. Mm. Mm. It's, it's interesting. Um, I've been reading So You Want to Talk About Race. And one of my favorite techniques that she talks about is rather than respond to a microaggression by being like, hey, that was racist, you respond to a microaggression by saying, hey, that was racist, and here's how what that said contributes to a larger system of racism because it reinforces beliefs about people that are X, Y, Z. And, and so the tactic that you're talking about, Musa, of like <laughs> basically creating a teachable moment. Yes. Uh, oh, about, yeah, yeah. about the structures is, I think um, it's, so, it's so interesting. And it's interesting because like, what social media was, I joined social. I, jo I joined Twitter specifically in 2009 during the Arab Spring because a, f a friend of mine who was in the know told me that you couldn't get any good substantive reporting from major news streams. They just weren't covering it. But these were the accounts that you could start to follow on Twitter. And, and so that's what I was like. I came to Twitter also as an observer. Um, and we've seen the power of money <laughs> to pervert these platforms, right? So once they become about delivering shareholder value rather than deliver connecting and delivering information, then we all have to build tactics to preserve mm -hmm. what's good about them and sort of like navigate what's bad about them. But to the point earlier of media literacy, I'm sort of curious about uh, like, is, is this a place, I mean, Rebecca, you just said that like you get some of your story ideas from observations on Twitter. Like it's, are we, are we sort of bought in to Dino's like it's trash and I'm not leaving? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> because, because ultimately it has enough value and we're, this, is a, this is a place where we're all willing to play inside the system. Hmm. Well, when I say it's trash and we're living in, <laughs> I, I was I like, oh, within the with, within the trash, there's like you have to dig through a lot of trash in yeah. order to, to 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 find the good stuff, or just follow non-trash people, or yeah. um, uh, it, it's it, it is like who you surround yourself with, and and yeah. where you get your news from, and you know who you rely on. You know, you could you have I follow people who I could have friendly debates with about about things. We're not just yelling at each other. Um and I do want to go to kind of like what you were saying earlier is like um I I just oh my god I'm gonna sound so I'm adorable. Just, oh my god the hair <laughs> <laughs> what, what's going on cameo <laughs> wow oh my goodness this beautiful child. hi <laughs> oh my goodness. She, she always has to visit. So this is Mina. Hi, Hi Mina. Mina. Your live stream oh you. You're yeah. live wow. streaming on, on a very important discussion. It just got more <laughs> just got more important. Yeah. Um what was it? Wait, what was I saying? Oh yeah, I was about to be very LA and name drop. Uh, we just, we just got. I, I just but before this, I was recording a podcast with Tracy Ellis Ross, mm -hmm. and she made this really interesting uh, um, point. She was all, "Don't call people out, call people in." Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, what if you're gonna call someone out, just don't call them out and just like leave them there. Like uh, Emily, like what you said, call them out and then explain why. You know what they're doing is trash or and it's up to them if they want to accept that if they don't you know maybe half of them won't but at least it kind of gives you this peace yeah. of mind that yeah. you know hey i said what i said and if they don't take it then that's their problem um and i mean i'll admit i still have you know i have sometimes this unhealthy urge for everyone to like me um mm. <laughs> but that's not reality no, everyone's not going to like what you write, um, it, it, it's, it's especially, you know, 
even like not only trolls, but even people within your own community. Mm -hmm. You you will say like, let's say I report on something Asian. They're like, oh, well, you didn't mention this. You didn't mention this. You didn't mention this or this. What's your problem? You're not representing the community well. And I'm like, oh, because I'm only one person. You know, it's like, it's like, and this is why we need a diverse newsroom. Yeah. Did I even answer a question? I, I felt yeah. like I was just talking. No, I, I actually, I, I appreciated that, um, particularly because I think if you, look, I got together a panel of brilliant journalists who I know, because that was the easiest panel for me to get together. What I think is interesting is that inevitably we, we have to talk about identities and perspectives and diversity and representation because, um, and people are like, oh, I'm so tired of like talking about this stuff. And you're like, it is the only stuff. Like that's what journalism is. It's identities and perspectives and representation. Right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the whole thing. Um, and and so I'm, I'm just sort of curious about um, how much, uh, how much you do. <laughs> Right. What what is your what are your what are your techniques and takes about incorporating identities and perspectives uh, as you're as you're like you know moving through your stories um, that are I don't actually know how to ask this question like there is another side that believes another set of stuff. Right, mm -hmm. it's not a cool perspective. Like believes that none of us should have rights, or you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, but there is that side. Um, is there is there ever a thread to your work? Because we've talked about this vis-a-vis -vis social media, but is there a thread to your work that's actually like trying to trying to gather more reasonable conversation, or is it sort of like people will take what they're going to take, and then there's like the lost cause group? I don't know what I'm I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I. I've been, I wrote a piece this week about anti-racism and suicide prevention. Like there's a, been a reckoning uh, since George Floyd's death, um, like with everything else, um, long overdue and necessary um, in suicide prevention about um, the fact that that field is not equipped to address the needs um, and experiences of black people, of indigenous people, of people of color. And as I was reporting this, um, I was talking to people whose voices don't get heard that often. Um, and also realizing that there are people out there right now who don't believe that anti-racism is a good thing. And they're not far right folks. They just, you know, um, some of the folks on the people, the people who signed the Harper's letter, you know, there's like a lot of conversation around that anti-racism not being, um, I don't know, something we should be doing right now for lack of a better phrase. And so I was thinking through that, trying to figure out like, you know, does that, we don't need to have that discussion in this piece, but trying mm. to figure out like, what does that mean when I'm hearing from all these people whose voices are never heard that their lives and their, the people um, in their community, you know, are suffering disproportionately because this field is predominantly white and and you know the rest of the story so for the people i'm talking to they're saying we need this we really need this now does that mean the people who think that anti-racism is bad should deserve a, a spot in that story i don't know you could argue maybe but i chose not to mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think they do and you know i don't think they do because ultimately that approach they come with when someone approaches you with a slick, and I'm, you know, I'll take a far right example. When a far right person approaches you and gives you the kind of rhetoric about the great replacement and we're concerned about being absorbed by whatever, I tend to interrogate what are the effects of your ideology? Mm -hmm. It's very easy to have a conversation with someone over coffee and they talk to me and it's like slick talk. And I publish the opinion piece in the New York Times, wherever they publish it, and it, it all sounds lovely. And then you've all of a sudden, you've got like, you know, well polished authoritarianism. Instead, I report on the effects on the most marginalized people. Mm. So, okay, this is your ideology. Sounds very interesting. Let's split to scrutiny. So what are the effects practically of, of Holocaust denial? What does that do? What does rhetoric do? Okay, freedom of speech. Great, okay, freedom of speech. Your speech is free. 
let's look at the receipts. Let's look at the um, the outcomes of freedom of speech. Let's see, mm. let's what your speech is costing people. Mm. See that that becomes a very uncomfortable conversation very quickly. Mm. So I always like to evaluate. Okay, you've got an ideology, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm, yeah. so let's let's subject it to stress testing. Mm. So that's how, I, and that way, if you do it that way, if you contextualize, for example, the FBI recently just tweeted out the protocols of the elders of Zion. Right. A lot of people are like, oh, that's freedom of speech. And I'm like, hang on a minute. The protocols of the elders of Zion were basically created so they'd be spread, and they put more anti-Semitism out into the universe. Right. We know that the demonstrable effects of that freedom of speech are out there. So let's apply the same things. If you want to have, oh, Musa, there's no balanced opinions. Yeah, there are, actually. I've written pieces about the far right and their role in Germany and in Europe more widely. And I always, always evaluate directly. So, for example, I talk about the far right rhetoric. I mentioned that in my piece. But I also mentioned the UN Commission on Human Rights saying, actually, this argument, this type of um, rhetoric against refugees is directly linked to authoritarian policies that result in directly more drownings in the Mediterranean. So or if you're gonna say stuff, say it, but then be accountable for it. Mm. That's how that's how I navigate it in a balanced fashion, I think. Mm. Yeah. I, I think uh like Musa and Rebecca kind of report on heavier stuff than I do. <laughs> I mean I'm doing more uh film film and TV, but at the same time, I mean I, I did cover I, I went to a pro, one of one of the kind of first protest here after George Floyd got murdered. Um, and I was I was at, there at the beginning of the rally where, you know, people are speaking and it's like very inspirational. And then it happened, you know, the 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 looting happened and the the rubber bullets happened. I was I left before that happened, uh, but I reported on it and I interviewed people who were there. Um, so that's kind of with my reporting with entertainment and film. It, it, this sounds weird, but when I report, I think one, would this be reported at deadline if I weren't here? Mm -hmm. And then two, um, I, I say, I tell them, I ask myself, I, I'm like, oh, I, in this weird way, I'm trying to convince Hollywood that these stories matter, mm -hmm. that people of color, that queer people, that trans people, that that you know, uh, you know, the, these these stories, these actors, these anything from an indie to a blockbuster, you know, or just like a web series that I think is telling a good message. I, I just, I think I just try to put shine where shine is deserved, mm -hmm. especially in these stories, because, you know, that hashtag representation matters. We see it a lot, right? But it really does. It's like, I've been tweeting, I've been, okay, just real talk, I've been re-watching Moesha lately. And, uh, <laughs> And I and then like and then that led me to remember the Cinderella with Brandy, mm. where it, there was a he, there was a Filipino prince and it, it was Whoopi Goldberg and I think Victor Garber were the, the the king and queen who were the mother and father of a Filipino prince and this kind of tapestry of brown black and white and and when I saw that I was all wow this kind of has meaning and mm. you know it's like. If you're if you're gonna tell stories, have it reflect what is really out there. Mm. And so that's how when I approach film and television reporting, I just am like, oh, it, it sounds so weird because I shouldn't say it, but it's I report on what I try to convince people. Yeah, these we matter, you know, and that's kind of the stance I take. Um, we have gone so far over time, and I know that this conversation could go <laughs> on for so much longer. They, you're like some of my favorite people in the world to talk to. Thank so um, this is just uh, this has been really wonderful, and I think um, so much food for thought here as writers and journalists and storytellers are uh, thinking about how to forge ahead in in this world. And I feel like there's been so much also practical advice. So thank you, all three of you so much. Thank you for staying up late in Berlin, Musa. I really appreciate it. What time is it in Berlin? Oh my goodness, it's 10 past midnight. Oh, uh, wow. Oh my God. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> always, always on the grind, always on the grind, always on the grind. <laughs> it's so far past my bedtime, it's not even funny. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm Thank wishing you. Thank you, Emily. Really wonderful uh, week and weekend, and for those of you in California, safety from the fires. Yes. So, uh, mm. oh. And the heat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Board. Yeah, I hope we'll see you soon. Um, for my sign off piece here uh, from Seed and Spark, uh, our creative sustainability sessions happen on regular intervals. You can find them at seedandspark.com forward slash events. Um, and if this was really valuable to you and you have a couple bucks to ship in, uh, these are always provided for free. Um, but we keep them free because uh, some of you like to donate to make sure they're free for others. Um, if all you had uh, today was this time to invest in yourself. That is certainly good enough for us. Um, and so until next time, we'll see you very soon. Uh, signing off from Seed and Spark.